The Buddhists have a saying, in our lifetime we'll experience 10,000 joys and 10,000 sorrows. But what do we do when the sorrows come to visit and how do we experience them without creating even more suffering for ourselves? How do we accept that this is how it is right now? Next on Speak Your Mind. Welcome to Speak Your Mind. I'm Dr. Carolyn Phelps, licensed psychologist with the Human Development Center. I heard this quote from Cooking Monster, you know, the Muppet from Sesame Street. Today, me will live in the moment, unless the moment is unpleasant, in which case, me will eat a cookie. I love this quote because I think it pretty much sums up our first instinct in dealing with adversity. We try to find a work around rather than a work through. And if it's a work around that removes us from reality, all the better, because the last thing that we often want to acknowledge is this is how it is right now when we're in the middle of adversity. And yet it's our ability to accept what is the actuality of this moment that will help us move through all the pain to a place of hope. So how do we do that? Well, I have a wonderful guest who's going to help us understand why we should be interested in and how to accept that this is how it is right now. So if you're thinking out there, well, I've got a lot of questions about that, start calling them in now. Locally, dial 218-788-2844 or call toll-free at 1-877-307-8762. We'll be answering your questions throughout tonight's show. My guest is Casey Ladd, a licensed family therapist who used to be with the Human Development Center and now is in private practice in Duluth. You can find her at DuluthFamilyTherapy.com. She specializes in treating couples, families, and children. Thank you so much for being here. And we're talking really about dealing with some of the big challenges that we face in life. And the first thing is, is that we're all going to face some of those challenges. And I think like when they come calling, we're often just so surprised by that as if we've had a star by mm -hmm. our name that says somehow I'm exempt from that. And talk a little bit just about even how that sense of surprise interferes with our ability to to begin to accept that this is how it is right now. Well, as uh, Carolyn, as you and I have talked about that in our practice, that oftentimes um, clients will come into our office when they are in deep suffering, a death, a terminal illness, um, some misfortune that's happened to somebody that they love. and. And oftentimes the first thing that I'll hear people say is, why is God letting this happen to me? And I think that that's a common concept that we have in our culture, that if bad things happen to you, that somehow you're being punished or that bad things shouldn't happen to you. And um, so that immediately I think people are struggling with that question of why me? And how, talk, let's talk a little bit about how that why me is really a toxic question because I think that that's a toxic question that, that people keep asking and keep asking. But I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Well, I think that, that, that when suffering comes, that if, if I can try to understand um, how this happened, then it might feel like I can get my arms around it a little bit and not have it feel so out of, con that I would feel so out of control. And um, that, that um, this, you know, I, this summer um, I was diagnosed with breast cancer and, and I, I was shocked. I've been healthy my entire life and, and I could, and I've said to people that at 65, I was able to deal with this differently than I think I would have 20 years ago because my commitment through that process was to live in this moment and not tell myself any stories. Any stories about, oh my goodness, this is fatal, I'm gonna die. Um, not to let myself catastrophize this or to go to some fairy tale that says, oh, everything's gonna be okay. 
And so just learning to live with the not knowing and to be able to carry that, certainly not by myself, um, that, that, that I was able to, I think, reach out for the love and support that I needed to not get into some spiral of feeling sorry for myself because this was happening to me. The, um, you said something really important, which is that talking about the stories, that you weren't going to write stories about this experience. You weren't going to pre-write the future mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. that. And I think one of the things that people do is is, is the, they pre-write the catastrophe, the worst case scenario. But you said something also just now that I, I'm just really intrigued with about that you weren't going to write just sort of the fantasy happy ending either. Right, right. As if we think that they're only, like, it, it has to be one or the other. That's right. And, 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 um, and again, w we will meet with clients who tend to kind of go to those opposite extremes. People who I think have, in their lives, have been more optimistic, more hopeful, that they can land in th that camp or the people I think who tend to be um, more worried and anxious um, that that they can um, you know get to that point of of just not of having that hopelessness and then I think b b both of those extremes rob us I think of that opportunity in terms of learning how to cope with staying in this reality of not knowing. So you just said that it was an opportunity because I think when people are in the middle of some big adversity, mm -hmm. I'm not sure how much of an opportunity, you know, I know like through my whole, through my husband's death, it's like, um, you know, I, I, I would think to myself like, yeah, some people would say this is, a, this is, <laughs> this is some weird opportunity and it doesn't always feel like an opportunity. Will you talk a little bit more about um, wh where is the gift in that? Right. In, the, in the Chinese ideogram, the same symbol is used for crisis as it is for opportunity. And so when something is, happens to us for the first time, for, you know, that, that your husband suddenly dies, that you get diagnosed with cancer, um, that it's something that I've never lived through before. And so I think the initial response is terror about how do I, I don't know how to do this. Mm -hmm. I know how to do a lot of things in life, but I don't know how to do this. And, and that is, um, I think the, the acknowledgement of that, certainly feeling the fear and in this moment to feel terror is normal. And then um, this, I think that some of my thinking about this really has changed since as we started at, at HDC in 2008 to start working with birth to five-year-olds. So here I'm finding myself working with families with very young children. And what I realize is infants get distressed, toddlers get distressed, but they don't have the ability to tell themselves the stories. They're just distressed and they need people to love them and to be with them and to help comfort them in that distress. And I started with, as I was working then with teenagers and adult clients, this, that, that the process is very similar, that in our distress, how is it that we let people know what we need to be direct about that, to not think that we're a burden, and to invite them to to be supportive and is in the clearer that we can be the better that we're going to get what we need. I think that in the middle of the the really tough tough sorrows it feels very isolating and there is this sort of egocentric uh, point of view of almost you know nobody under, can be that nobody understands me no one understands what I'm going through now and some of that can be intensified as other people maybe in their life say things that don't necessarily ring, ring true or rub the sufferer the wrong way. And so that, that how does that contribute to the sense of isolation then? And what does the person do with that? You know, I'm feeling like I'm the only one here, which isn't true because there's seven billion people in this world. Um, somebody has gone through what you have gone through. Uh, and, but how, 
how does that person start sharing then in, in the midst of feeling this isolation? Well, big question. And, and as you ask the question, I'm thinking that in our culture, I think we've made it more difficult because I think some of the wisdom or the stories from the elders um, that we're missing that as a culture in terms of how those, those filter down. And um, so trying to, um, to just, I think, trust that other people have suffered and people who love me want to be on the journey with me. And I think sometimes they don't know what to say. They don't know what to do. And sometimes they, they say things that are mm, offensive or not helpful. Um, and that, that being able to be with, to, so to ask somebody to even to say, can you go for a walk with me? And I don't want to talk about my grief right now, or I don't want to talk about my mm -hmm. fear right now. Just help me be on the lake walk and notice the sounds and the smells and the beauty that's around us, because it's hard for me to access that on my own right now. Um, so to be able to really um, give our family and friends some specific things that they might be able to do for us, that it would be really helpful if you could, you know, go to a movie with me or bring a meal to me. And again, please don't feel sorry for me because I think that that also creates a distance because I don't want other people to suffer in my suffering. And um, uh, so it's, it's, I'm oftentimes helping clients really find the language about who is it in your life that you trust, who is it that you can be very specific with, and, um, and that if people start to be too intrusive, how can you very respectfully, you know, have them kind of, you know, let, let them know that you're okay. I love that, what you said about, please don't feel sorry for me, because that makes it even harder for me yes. then. <clears throat> um, and just being able to give people the words to say, because I think that in the midst of, of really great suffering where everything feels so new, it's like, and now I've lost the, my ability to communicate as, as, right. as, as, as well. And sometimes having that, and I love what you said about that, when we don't have the stories from the elders, what we lose is that sense of others have traveled this path before us then. Um, talk a little bit about, because you've had this experience now recently, you know, with the diagnosis of cancer, of, you know, you said of that you were going to live in the moment, and sometimes that includes being afraid. And being afraid is, that's something we usually want to run away from. Oh, right, right. And the, and I can say that, you know, being afraid and being, to having access to people who I know care about me and reaching out to them quells the fear. That it, um, and that, that sense about that I am not on this journey by myself. Um, and I think also, I know that it's a time that it, it sharpened my own spiritual practice in terms of prayer, in terms of, you know, I found myself going to read some of the Psalms or, um, and, and really being mindful about that, that I cannot do this alone. So it, it, I think, heightened my awareness about my need to practice um, some of that discipline about my, my prayer life as well as to surround myself with people who, who could be with me without in some ways adding to the, the burden. So. And I, I, I love what you said, which is that when you were able to invite people in and know that and, and have people with you who you knew were, would, were supportive and who loved you, that the fear then melted away as well. Because I think, I think our fear about the fear is that it's just gonna stay and it's going to grow and it's going to grow and how long am I going to have to hold this right. fear and that right. it's going to be never ending. That's right, that's right. One of the places, and we had had a discussion uh, about a month ago about this, that people can get stuck in dealing with adversity is in bitterness. Yes. And you have a wonderful story 
that I just absolutely love, love, love about about that. And I'd like you to share that that story and uh, this whole notion of how can we not get stuck in bitterness because that's not a place where any of us want to live our life. Right. So I was 21 and I think the first great disappointment had, was happening in my life and it was my parents' divorce. And I was one of six kids and and had this illusion that we really were this pretty perfect family. And so the shattering of that, I mean, I can remember trying to make deals with God that, you know, if, if you let this happen, then I'll do this kind of like some kind of a deal. And I was getting very bitter and I was depressed. And I had a great aunt, Laura, who um, was wonderful. And she invited me over one day for lunch. And um, as I was getting off the elevator, my uncle was getting on the elevator and I said, Uncle Ian, why are you, where are you going? And he said, this is a girl's chat. That was my first inclination that there was something that was going to happen. And at that lunch, she, um, she asked me if I knew the story of her son, Edward, and I did. He was my mother's cousin and I knew that he was killed at age 20 in a car crash. It was the, um, and, but I'd, I'd never talked to my aunt about this. And she started talking about the fact that she had only wanted to be a wonderful mother, have a lot of kids, and he was her only child, and he was killed in this very tragic way. And she described how she became bitter, she was depressed, she stopped talking to her mother and all of her sisters and my uncle. And then one day in the Duluth, and it wasn't Duluth, it was Winona, newspaper she saw that another mother had lost a child 16 years old in a, a car crash. And she called my uncle and she said, will you take me to this house? He didn't want to because we didn't, they didn't know them. But she went and she knelt in front of that woman and she said, um, I um, lost my son. And they embraced and then they met every week and then there was a third mother and a fourth mother. And she said to me, you have to find a way to turn your bitterness into universal compassion. And for me as a 21 year old, that has been a gift that has benefited me, but it's also benefited my friends and certainly I think my clients because what she modeled was that you don't avoid the suffering, but that you, you have to somehow learn how to transform it and get back out into the world and give love. The, I remember, and I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share this with you all, that um, that last year, which was the living through the second year of of my husband's death, and and I thought that the you know I thought I thought the second year was going to be easier, and mm -hmm. it turned out to be as hard in some ways and harder in other ways, and and you just sat with me and you said that's okay, and then you will get back in the world. And I remember thinking then, I have no idea how I'm going to get back in the world. Right. And now I understand right. those words. But the power of that message, when somebody is deep in despair, that there is a world that you might want to someday get mm -hmm. back into. Mm -hmm. um, that to me was, um, it, you know, at first I was curious about that. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't even say hopeful because I couldn't imagine it. Mm -hmm. But as time went on, I kind of thought like, yeah, maybe there is. Mm -hmm. Maybe there, maybe mm -hmm. there is with that. That's such a powerful statement, mm -hmm. that notion of getting back in the world. Mm -hmm. And to recognize that each person has different timing with that. And so um, we have to be careful not to try to impose some some, you know, after a year or after two years or after six months, that, that each person, I think that we as people who care about somebody who's mm -hmm. suffering is to be able to hold the hope that it won't always be this way. Um, it was, um, and so that there are sometimes those very dark times where people in that suffering can contemplate suicide as a way of ending it. And, and, and I think that that that's always um, a possibility, especially as people get isolated and get more into that darkness. And um, so to be a good friend is to be able to 
be with somebody who is in deep suffering without feeling like you have to fix them. Um, and to be able to accept that this is where you are right now and I care about you. And I'm just gonna be here. You don't have to do anything. I, I think that that power of just being willing to sit with the person or being the, in the room with the person or going for the walk mm -hmm. with the person that I think that a lot of a lot of the support people underestimate just how powerful that is just to have another human being that having another human being in our presence is what makes us not feel so isolated and when we're less isolated then w that is the best protective factor against any thoughts about suicide or any action towards suicide then this con uh, my connection to another human being right mm -hmm. and I, and i would say that as a young person i heard people say that you just need to be with people when they're in their suffering and i it was impossible for me to do i would get anxious i would talk too much i would you know want to make them feel better and it is one of the things i i believe happens as a human being, as you've lived through different experiences of suffering yourself or watching other people kind of go through deep suffering, that you learn to be quiet in that and to be, to, to trust that being quiet and loving and being with is exactly what they need. The other thing that I love about the saying, this is how it is right now, when I first heard that saying, my favorite part, and, and I first heard it last year when I was in, in great despair, was the right now. And mm -hmm. the right now mm -hmm. part mm -hmm. is what gave me hope because that said to me, oh, not forever. Right, right. Um, that I was writing a story about forever and the right now part just sort of brings me back to um, if I can just be in this moment and take in this moment that's all I need to be mm -hmm. concerned about. That's right, that's right. The, um, in your own journey with this can with, with the cancer mm -hmm. diagnosis mm -hmm. What was the path like? Because I think that uh, we would want to say th the concept of staying in the moment, it's, it's, not, it's not that you feel good all of the time. Mm -hmm. I was um, proactive in finding out about the team. <laughs> and I can say that St. Luke's, I, I, I can just cheer out you know, for St. Luke's um, oncology, radiology, surgeons, they were so I, but I asked and I, I found people and kind of tried to say, I'm not gonna just let somebody be assigned to me that I'm gonna do a little bit of that homework because that was something I could do in the now and be active in that. Mm -hmm. and, um, and as it so happened, the people that I heard were great are on my team. I met with my Dr. Silva today and prognosis is very good. Um, but I think also to be clear with them about what I needed. You know, I had 12 questions for one, you know, appointment and I came in and she had read them and answered them. And so I think being clear about what is it that I do need that I can reach out for and that I can be assertive in trying to make my needs known, not in a demanding way, but in a very clear way, that was helpful. And so we're nearing the end of our conversation mm, for this. Yeah, it, it is possible. <clears throat> and so in this concept of bearing adversity and embracing this is how it is right now and that as a pathway um, to, to enduring the pain that we all have coming our way mm -hmm. or that we're all experiencing mm -hmm. maybe in this moment, um, what is your message of hope for our viewing audience then? Oh, I think that um, that feeling uh, of trying to um, identify the safe people in your life and to try before the suffering comes, if you can, can plant those seeds and know that there will be a time that you will be on the receiving end and to be generous in being on the giving end, that 
to try to keep that strong throughout our life at times of joy as well as during some of the times of suffering. And I love your message also about transforming our own pain and suffering into universal compassion as a way of keeping us out of the bitterness. Those are some wise words. And um, we're going to be having Casey back on the show again later because she's that great and, that, and we love hearing from her. Thanks so much for joining the discussion. And don't forget to visit us on the web at speakyourmindonline.org where you can find a schedule of our topics and resource links. Join us again next week when we'll be talking about medications and mental illness. I'm Dr. Carolyn Phelps. Thanks for watching and good night. <music>